Well, welcome to the mathematics section. That will take the whole morning. Uh, when one looks at the depth and the breadth of Freeman Dyson's contributions, it's hard to believe that he's really just one person. Uh, I think if you came from somewhere else and didn't know anything, you'd think that, that it could not just be one person who was contributing in all these different areas. Of course, living to 90 helps in that way. Also, starting at a very young age, which he did in mathematics, and uh, I look forward to many more years of having Freeman contribute to our field. Like many scientists, and especially physicists, uh, Freeman's first encounters were in mathematics at a very early age, as I said. And he's made substantial contributions, and the impact of his contributions are some of which you'll see today. As Freeman notes in some of his writings, mathematics papers have much, a much longer shelf life than a physics paper. Physics papers come and go in a lot of fashion. <laughs> but <laughs> mathematics, if you make foundational contributions, remains for a long time, and a number of Freeman's works fall into this category. Uh, we even heard that uh, Dyson Hall has a two-day <laughs> <laughs> lifespan. <coughs> Over the years, Freeman has strayed into many other fields, as we all know, but he's never really left mathematics, as far as I can see, and every so often he returns with to his favorite early-year mathematical problems with new insights and visions and, and further impact. So for this morning, for our lectures, we chose two topics uh, of themes in Freeman's work, two which are very active today. As Natty said, we try to look as to what's happening today. But before I turn to those two and introduce the first speaker, I would like to mention uh, that amongst many of his other very influential works, there are two that I, I cherish very highly, and I'll mention these two. Uh, the first is concerned with an old problem of Minkowski in the geometry of numbers, uh, in which I think it was Davenport maybe who gave him this problem, uh, and Freeman writes that he tried to do this problem, and he, on the basis of solving it or not, he decided whether he'll be a mathematician or not. Uh, he made great progress. He solved it in dimension four. The problem's concerned about an extremal uh, configuration of a lattice in n dimensions. Minkowski's conjecture says that the worst case position for a point for any lattice when measured by any certain distance, which is the product of the coordinates rather than uh, the usual Euclidean distance, is always less than or equal to two to the minus n. And Minkowski himself, and, and the extremal case is the standard lattice. Minkowski himself uh, proved the conjecture in dimension two, and Remac in dimension three, and Freeman set out to do it in general. And he solved it in dimension four, it's a well-celebrated result. Uh, he, he marvels about it in his writings because uh, he felt He's the first to introduce topological ideas into the problem. Uh, and so he has a paper in the annals in, uh, with a purely topological theorem, developed precisely for the purpose of proving this result. Skubenko later did the case of five. And very recently, maybe you don't know, Kurt McMullen from Harvard University did the case of six, developing these topological and geometric methods quite a bit further, as far as I know. Uh, you could have got a job at Harvard, maybe. <laughs> based. So maybe you should have not given up your direct involvement in mathematics. Of course, he returned all the time, never really left it. The other paper, which is extremely influential, uh, is a 47 paper of Freeman. It's in Diophantine Approximation of Algebraic Numbers of Degree N, in which he tried to improve a result, or he did improve slightly, a result of Siegel. Uh, the theorem gives a lower bound for how well you can approximate an algebraic number by rational numbers, quantitative lower bound. And he managed to improve Siegel slightly, very slightly. Uh, anybody who's ever tried to improve anything that Siegel ever did, did <laughs> appreciates that this is a tremendous achievement, especially for a newcomer into the field at such, such a young age. But the importance of his paper, which I think is not about the slight improvement, is that he proved a little lemma there. And let me tell you, a lemma usually is much bigger than a theorem. You might have heard of the fundamental lemma recently. Why, why is this word lemma such a popular thing? If you have a lemma, it's usually used by everybody else. 
it's usually much more broadly, with a much broader impact. And this lemma is just known as Dyson's lemma. Enrico Bombieri was the first to use it to give effective lower bounds to rational approximation to certain algebraic numbers, uh, the effectivity being the point there. And Dyson's lemma, which is concerned about a function polynomial in two variables and a weighted sum of multiplicities of orders of vanishing at n distinct points, is a, a critical ingredient. And later on, uh, Paul Voita gave a, using Dyson's lemma, as a key ingredient, gave a proof, uh, or, and Enrico Bombieri gave a, a variation of this proof, of the famous Mordell conjecture in which the Dyson lemma plays an absolutely critical role. The Mordell conjecture, also known today as Folding's theorem, is probably one of the deepest things we know in the theory of numbers. It's a finiteness theorem about the number of rational points on a curve of genus greater than or equal to two. And this proof that was found by Voita and Bombieri has Dyson's lemma as a key ingredient. So that paper has had a massive impact. Uh, Dyson also has a very well-known and documented encounter with Hugh Montgomery on the zeros of the zeta function and its potential relation or its relation to eigenvalues of random matrices from a certain ensemble, which has impacted a lot of the theory and of the of, uh, study of the subject today. And that was just an encounter between Dyson and Montgomery here, here at the Institute in the early 70s. So this brings me to the first speaker's topic today, which is random matrix theory. During the decade 1960 to 1970, Freeman turned to study the, the statistical properties of eigenvalues of random matrices. Maybe in physics they viewed him as really going off into some strange direction. but. As we all know and uh, have heard, uh, somehow he knows where to look and what will have an impact in the future. And during these years, he developed the foundations of this theory, computing the correlations in various ensembles, uh, introducing what's called the Brownian, uh, Dyson Brownian motion for the eigenvalues, which play a critical role in all recent developments. And he uh, also termed the, oh, wrote a paper called The Threefold Way, which introduced into the subject universality in a very major way, and it explained it in terms of three ensembles. Our first uh, speaker today is H.T. Yao, who has worked on uh, the universality problem in random matrix theory. There has been a great advance recently in uh, the, the context of what's called the Vigna ensemble. I'm sure it will be explained where a full universality has been uh, proved by Schlein, Yao, and Erdos. And H.T. Yao, who's a professor at Harvard, is a, a member at the School of Math this year, where we have a special program uh, inspired by or related to these developments. So let me introduce our first speaker, H.T. Yao from Harvard. Thank you. So this is deep. Um, so thanks a lot uh, for this uh, opportunity to speak in Dyson's uh, first day meeting. I was a uh, postdoctor at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in uh, 1987. So uh, I talked with uh, Freeman about what's the best problem to do. And uh, uh, at the time I was working on stability of matter. And then I I look at uh, various of his paper, but one of my biggest regrets is uh, I didn't look at random matrix. So, so I didn't work on that, and uh, after 15 years, and then I find that this is one of the uh, most interesting subject I ever encountered. So today, I will talk about uh, universality of random matrices, and especially dyson brown motion, and also a little bit about its quantum agadicity for in the context of matrix. So this is a joint work with uh, uh, Paul Bouguet and uh, Lasser Erdish, Andy, uh, Andy North and Benjamin Schwein and Ian Jean. All right, so, so let me first just mention a few uh, people and the concept uh, I will talk about today. The first one is Eugene Wiedemann. 
And uh, uh, his, his vision is uh, to say that if you look at energy level of large nuclei, then you will have uh, universal spacing statistics, and then this universal statistics can be described by random matrices. So, the, so this was a grand vision by uh, Eugene Wigner. And about the Freeman Dysons, uh, the key, of course, he did many things in random matrices, but today I want to emphasize uh, one single concept, which actually has a deep uh, influence. The concept is, uh, he talked about the Dyson Brownian motion. This is a gas of particles with the logarithmic interactions will reach local equilibrium very fast. And this, this concept becomes the whole foundation of our work on the universality of random matrices. And then I will mention uh, a few concepts by other scientists, uh, especially uh, Anita Tuo by Di Giorgio Ness and Moser, which talk about regularity theory of hyperbolic equations. And then I will also mention, uh, but only briefly, this quantum chaos conjecture and the Anderson model. One last thing is, uh, uh, I will also show that the Dyson Brownian motion can be used to answer a question about quantum agadicities and uh, uh, in the context of metrics. So this is uh, introduced by Lunik and Sarnak. Uh, so if you look at this uh, experimental data of the uh, excitation a spectrum of uh, heavy nuclei, then you find that it's fairly regular. You can see that the pattern is fairly regular. And then the Wigner is trying to, to model uh, this kind of excitation spectrum. So his idea is to use random matrices. And then there's uh, this, he has an interesting quote I like very much is, uh, this is such a horribly complicated problem because the large nuclei uh, where it has such complicated interaction, it's almost impossible to understand it. But his point is, uh, well, if you forget about everything, just look, take a matrix completely random, then it's a good model for this kind of question. So I especially appreciate he says that if you attack the problems in a simple-minded fashion, then the problem is easy. So this was Freeman, uh, this was Wigner in the 1955. Now let me start to introduce what's the random matrix. We start with the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. The Gaussian orthogonal ensemble is a matrix which metric elements are Gaussian random variables. We can allow you to talk and jump and jump. That's right. I, <laughs> if I don't turn, I feel a bit nervous. So, so the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble is, uh, you can see that there's a Gaussian uh, distribution here. It's each metric element is a Gaussian. And then, of course, you require it to be symmetric. And this means it's mainly zero. And I normalize the variance to be one over n. So then you can see that now the eigenvalues, you label eigenvalues lambda one to lambda n. The size is of order one. And this is the so-called Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. You can also talk about the uh, Hermitian and the Quaternion ensemble, and this is the, the Dyson's classification of classical ensemble. But today we will, uh, we will focus everything on the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble case. Now, the famous Wigner semicircle law is to compute the eigenvalue densities. Of course, here you assume that each metric element are independent. So if you take the independent, and if you look at the, in the case, uh, the eigenvalue di density, then you find the semicircle law. And the semicircle law is given here. You see this, they are, this is the eigenvalue density uh, in these pictures. So this was Wigner's, Wigner's theorem. It tells you there how many eigenvalues you can find in the, um, in the interval here. It's given by this uh, semicircle law. Now, but on the other hand, the question you want to ask is much more um, ambitious because you want to know not just the, the eigenvalue density, you want to know what's the spacing structure. And the spacing structure 
you can imagine it's very difficult to compute. So if you magnify the spacing, if you magnify the spacing, now if you put n eigenvalue from minus two to two, so if you magnify it, uh, then the, the typical, first of all, the typical space is one of n. So if you magnify it by a factor n in order to see the structure, and this is uh, it's a story break computation by Golden Meta and by Dyson says uh, the space the space structure probability at the energy E is given by uh, this famous sine kernel one minus sine pi x one minus x two and divided by pi x one minus x two square, and this is a case not for the orthogonal case but for the unitary case. But let's just don't worry about this, that these technical points. And also, this is a function. This distribution is the function that appear in the Riemann zeta functions. But today, I will not talk about the number theory aspect and only about the morphedix and the matrix aspect of this problem. Now, um, so the interesting thing is uh, this is a quote. This is in the uh, uh, in the recent article by Freeman. He he reflect about what happened at the time. He said that by 1970s, we had decided that random magic theory was a beautiful piece of pure mathematics, <laughs> having nothing to do with physics. And random magic theory went temporary to sleep. So I was, uh, you know, I was reading his article. I was expecting he was very excited, but he, he felt that he was very disappointed. But on the other hand, uh, that was because the, the experimental data at the time was not good enough. And then if you look at the, the data they later collected, for example, this data in 1983 of these uh, nuclear data ensembles, then you can see the histogram is already quite close to the GOE statistics. So the GOE statistics actually, uh, it didn't explain the data perfectly, but it's actually a very, very good model because the, the other choice of the standard mathematics, <laughs> oops, what? Laser oh, laser point, yes. Okay, okay good. Point. Great. So. Uh, you see, without laser pointer, I'm like, like a soldier with no, no gun, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, oh, wait. Did you see anything? Yeah. What? <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, gee, this is. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see, but it's almost invisible. <laughs> okay. Work? <laughs> oh. I think this is too bright, so that's why you, you can hardly see it. Okay, I will fight here with no guns, okay? <laughs> uh, so you look at, you imagine this is a laser pointer, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been giving my talk in all my life, has to, or not all my life, at least the last 10 years, with laser pointer, so. <laughs> all right. Okay, good. So, uh, so actually, it was uh, very good already. It's, uh, this nuclear data ensemble is already very good. So we feel more excited in the 1980s. Now, uh, but the, there is a question now. This is a computation for Gaussian models. What about the general system? How much you know about general system? You, the Gaussian model is wonderful and it's difficult and the deep calculation, but you still want to know um, the general case. So if this is a good model, then it has to be the random matrix statistics a new class of universal law for highly correlated system. If this belief is correct, then this is a, a big universal law like a Gaussian statistics. It will be a fundamental object in mathematics and the nature. So, so this is a question. Unfortunately, if you ask a very simple case of this belief, so if you believe that the, this random matrix statistics is a good model for everything, for many, many different complicated, highly correlated systems. But then you ask a simple question, you take your Gaussian matrix, you just change each random variable from Gaussian to independent random variables. Then if the same thing is correct. See, so this is almost like a, a toy problem. It's also completely triviality with, compared with grand vision. The grand vision it says, uh, even very complicated system, you can model by random matrix. Now you just take a random matrix itself, except you change the Gaussian to non-Gaussian, then you ask if the answer is the same. But this question, 
was not answered until about five years ago. So this, the, this is a so-called Wigner Bison meta conjecture. And then today I will describe how this problem is solved and why, how this is related to the Dyson Brownian motions. Right. Now, now, there's one more thing I want to introduce. It is the quantum chaos and the Anderson models. So, Anderson in 1958 take this, uh, uh, this random Schrodinger operator, and then again, he's interested in the, the eigenvalue statistics. And then the conjecture is, uh, or the belief or the theory says, uh, if you are in the delocalized region, this means the eigenstate are delocalized. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. Well, um, <laughs> there are some special effect. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is beyond my control. I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Well, I, I, I was still talking, so, but. Oh, I see. All right, okay, so you can see. Okay, so then I will just continue. So if you, in the delocalized regions, then, uh, then eigenvalue statistics is the same as random matrix. So this is a key idea. In, in the extended states, if eigenstate is everywhere, then you expect the statistic is the same as the uh, random matrix. On the other hand, you will get the Poisson statistics and in the localized regions. And the localized region is mathematically proved rigorously. And of course, this was Anderson's uh, grand vision, but the mathematics was proved by Florix, Spence, and Eisenman. Now, you can also extend this problem to the so-called quantum chaos. The quantum chaos is take a Laplace operator and uh, in the domain or in the manifold. And if the classical dynamics are chaotic, then you believe that random matrix statistics is, again, correct. So random matrix statistics, you can see that it's, 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 it's everywhere uh, in the problem. Now, I want to mention one more piece of uh, concept we'll, which, surprising, we can use dyson brown motion to answer this question, which is this quantum uh, unique agardicity conjecture. This QUE uh, is a conjecture it's by Ludnick and Sarnak. He says, uh, if you take eigenfunctions of the um, of a negative curvature manifold, and they are more general statements, but they stay in this case. And then you find an eigenfunction, at the end, it will become very flat. So you take an eigenfunction with a higher and higher frequency, and then at the end, the eigenfunction will become completely flat. And this is the picture of eigenfunctions uh, of, uh, you know, of, of a stadium. It looks very, very complicated. But at the end, the high frequency limit is expected under the condition of the chaotic assumption, then you will become flat. And uh, there are some average version called the quantum agardicity theorem and uh, proved by various, uh, uh, various scientists and mathematicians. And then there's also an arithmetic, arithmetic case by uh, Lu and Sanak for again, Linden Strauss and uh, Sandra Rarajan. But now, I'm, I'm not going to do anything about talk about anything about the manifold case, but we just ask the question, suppose you take a matrix which are completely random, do you know that the eigenfunction at the end, you will become completely flat? It's exactly the question of uh, um, this quantum unit agardicity on the matrix settings. And then, uh, so, so it seems that there's a deep connection between the quantum unique agardicity of delocalizations and to a random matrix stati statistics. They seem to always happen at the same time. Uh, we don't exactly know what exact happened. Of course, you can explain that the reason is because once the eigenvalue, eigenvector is very, very flat, so it correlated everybody to each other, so that's why it's correct. So the mathematic question we are trying to do today is uh, there are two basic questions. One is uh, this universality conjecture of vegan matrices, and the other one is this quantum unique agardicity for the vegan matrices. And then the emphasis, I want to say, is uh, the key ingredient to answer both questions is, is the use of Dyson Brownian motions. So this is a big surprise that the Dyson Brownian motion plays such a key role in both problems. Right. Now, 
The first one is the solution to the universality conjecture. This was a theorem by, I did together with Erdish, Shrine, and the Yin, and between 2009 and 2010. So it says the local eigenvalue statistics are universal for generalized Wigner ensembles. Now here we put generalized means, uh, it means the matrix elements distribution can be different. Uh, you, you, can, you can change the distribution of every matrix element. But then, uh, for example, you can change your variance. And, but then this is still the same statistics as the Gaussian case. So roughly speaking, this is the univer universality in the very, uh, you know, the first step of universality. You want to say the matrix model many things, but now this theorem says uh, if you change the distribution matrix, then it stays the same. I mean, in a way, this is like uh, central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says uh, if you take a random variable, you sum it together, it becomes Gaussian. Of course, you don't need to require each random variable are Gaussian in order to get a result. So this is the same. This is the same. You take the metric element, and uh, which, is, uh, which is not necessarily Gaussian, but the answer will be the same as the Gaussian case. Now, uh, they, are past, uh, they are parallel results by Tao and Wu, but they, their result require that the four moments matching uh, the Gaussian uh, random variables. So the, the first four moments has to be the same as the Gaussian case. And now, there are also other extensions to a sparse matrix beta ensemble. You know, there are various extensions, so uh, I will not say today. And so I will go to explain that why the Dyson Brownian motions uh, play such a key role in this problem. And now, about this uh, quantum unique agardicity. So this is uh, uh, a recent work I did with uh, and, and Paul Bougate, and actually the paper is uh, just half written, not completely written. So what he says is the following. So if you take a, take a Wigner matrices, and you look at the eigenvector. So here eigenvector is ui, i from one to n. These are eigenvector. And now the statement says that if you take eigenvector, and then you take a, take a vector Q, you project the eigenvector to, the vec to any fixed vector Q. Then you find that they will become a Gaussian random variable, this normal distribution once again. So roughly speaking, you take any eigenvector, you take a vector Q, you take a projection, and uh, then no matter what is this Q, then this eigenvector projection to the Q are Gaussian random variable. So if once you have this result, and we also know that different eigenvector, uh, this random variable will be independent, then you can derive a probabilistic version of uh, this quantum unit agardicity. This means with high probability, uh, this Gaussian case, hold, uh, this Gaussian random, in high, with high probability, this statement holds uh, for the nearby eigenvectors. And uh, then this was says uh, the eigenvector is completely flat because there's a law of large number. Once you once you establish a Gaussian independent, then you know it's a less low or large number, so it's completely flat. And uh, before this theorem, I should mention that there are two earlier results. One is I did what I did with early shrine. We proved the eigenvector are delocalized, and uh, but now the difference between delocalization and this QUE is the delocalization says uh, uh, is roughly the same. You can you can have up and down. But this QE means that at the end you will be completely flat. It's completely really flat. There's no, uh, there's no error. And so uh, on the at the edge of the vegan matrices, and this was uh, proved earlier by uh, uh, by Antinous and In. So now, so let me start to say what is uh, 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 what's Dyson boundary emotions. So. Uh, so Dyson Brownian motion is uh, so now let me try to explain the Dyson Brownian motion. You take a you take a metric element uh, H T. So you take a you take a matrix. So the matrix is n by n matrix. Now each metric element you let each metric element to to go along by independent Brownian motion. So so the question is uh, is rather easy. You, you, I think the idea was you take each metric element and then you let each metric element go by independent Brownian motion. So then this random matrix model, instead of become a, a stationary problem, it become a time dependent problem because each one can change. Can, and the Brownian motion is, uh, you see the half of the Brownian motion here, and uh, <laughs> you, the other half you just imagine, 
It's, uh, it's over there. And so, so look at this. Uh, um, and maybe if I flip to a leg, oh. OK, all right. So um, just a second. OK, so. Uh, so you take, uh, take a Dyson Brownian motion of each metric element. And then uh, I, I will go to the next page, because the next page, uh, <laughs> well, um, so this one, this line is not very useful. Um, <laughs> It's, well, can, can you can you read the? I, mean, I, I can read it here. So, uh, all right. So, so let me go back to the Dyson Brownian motion page. Okay. So, so Dyson Brownian motion. So you let each match element go by Dyson Brownian motions, and then you know this. Uh, this is Einstein technically mathematical. This is the einstein ulmberg process. The einstein ulmberg process you can really solve it exactly. If you solve it exactly you find that the distribution of dyson brownian motion at time t, you can solve it precisely by a linear combination of initial data, which I write as H0, and plus V. V is a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So roughly speaking, the solution of dyson brownian motion, you can actually write down explicitly. It's just initial data plus a Gaussian piece. You take a summation of two matrices together, then it's the answer. But you should see that when you take a matrix, two matrices sum together, their eigenvalue and eigenvector are extremely complicated because they are not commute to each other. So, so it's actually very complicated. So roughly speaking, the dyson brownian motion is really just you take a matrix and then you add a Gaussian piece. You can also think about a Gaussian piece is just a noise in your data. So this is the way, this is the way we view it. The, the Gaussian piece, suppose you do the, now you're doing the statistical applications. So you have a data. But in any data will have some noise, and this noise is the part of the Gaussian part here. So the Dyson Brownian motion actually becomes a very good model, even in application, because the, the noise part is exactly this Gaussian part. Okay. So, so we have this Dyson Brownian motion, and now, now we. Uh, this is a key observation. Uh, I think Freeman has the three key observations of Dyson Brownian motion. The first one, of course. They, he introduced this concept. The second one is, uh, if you look at eigenvalues of, uh, of, of this, uh, this matrix, then you find the eigenvalue was satisfied equation. This is the equation we call the dyson brownian motion. So now I want to distinguish two concepts. One is uh, if you let each metric element go by brownian motion, I would call this matrix dyson brownian motion. Okay. And the other one is, uh, if you look at eigenvalues, the eigenvalue evolution, the eigenvalue evolution has an equation, and this equation, I would call it, this equation is what people typically call the dyson brownian motion. So the dyson brownian motion will refer to the eigenvalue evolution equation. And now, because we don't have a, a you know, this, this is an important observation, because from the beginning, you look at the, if you look at each metric element go by Brownian motion, you don't really know the eigenvalue equation will couple with eigenvector or not. I mean, in principle, they can couple to each other. But on the other hand, the eigenvalue equation completely decoupled from the eigenvector, and this is a key observation. And now, the second thing is uh, you can also look at the equation of the eigenvector. So the equation of the eigenvector, the eigenvector, you see, eigenvector will, will keep on rotating and so on. But the eigenvector equation will also depend on eigenvalue. So the eigenvector equation is a nightmare. It's, it's terribly complicated. It's, uh, uh, you know, if you look at this eigenvector equation, you don't even believe that this equation can be analyzed because it's, uh, it's a horrible mess. <laughs> so, so, so nobody really, I mean, this equation was derived a long time ago, but nobody really looked at it. So, and now, so today, I'll, so this eigenvector equation, uh, I would call it Dyson eigenvector flow. So this is eigenvector equation. It depends on the eigenvalues. So now, so now let's see how we use this concept. Now this is the graph of the Dyson Brownian motions. So you can see that I start from n, n eigenvalue at the, exactly the same point, and then if you wait for some time, some time then you becomes uh, each eigenvalue will go by Brownian motion. It becomes a very complicated picture. 
All right. Now, now there's, uh, there's a key observation made by Dyson here is uh, he find that Dyson Brownian motions then has an invariant measure. Invariant measure is uh, if you look at distribution eigenvalues, and at the end there's a, there's a stationary distribution, and this stationary distribution is a, is a classical statistical physics object called a Coulomb gas. So the Coulomb gas is invariant under the Dyson Brownian motion. So the Coulomb gas, if you write in mathematics or if you can see on the, on the TV screen, the Coulomb gas is. Uh, uh, there's, there's a temperature parameter beta, and then there's energy. Then energy has a Gaussian piece, and plus uh, there's a log interaction. And the log interaction is why it's called a Coulomb gas. So the, the Dyson Brownian motion invariant measure is a classical Coulomb gas. And the, the classical Coulomb gas, the important thing of classical Coulomb gas is classical Coulomb gas is the probability density of the eigenvalue of the Gaussian case. So let me try to repeat this. Uh, sentence once again. So if you look at each metric element by Brownian motions, then, you, then the eigenvalue will have a, have a dynamics, and this dynamics was an invariant measure, and this invariant measure, of course, is exactly the, the Gaussian statistics in, uh, of the metrics from the, from the beginning. So, so you run by Dyson Brownian motion for each metric element, and here is the one which is completely Gaussian, which is Gaussian ensembles, and then you let eigenvalue goes, and then of course, you, at the end, you will go to the, the Gaussian case. Okay, and this is the GOE case. So the Dyson Brownian motion is an invariant measure, which is a classical Coulomb gas. And then Dyson made the, uh, a fundamental conjecture in his paper. He made the following observation. He says, uh, if you look at the, the time to equilibrium, because if you, uh, if you know the statistical physics, the first question you ask about dynamics is how fast you approach equilibrium. So the system approaches equilibrium in two steps. One is you approach equilibrium very fast locally, and then, then at the end, after some time, it becomes globally will approach the equilibrium. The time to approach to a global equilibrium is order one. You need time order one to reach global equilibrium. On the other hand, for metrics of size n, you will reach the local equilibrium at time one over n. The one over n is a typical eigenvalue spacing. So this is uh, 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 extremely surprising assertion because uh, your system has to wait for time n to reach global equilibrium. On the other hand, at time one over n, then you already reach local equilibrium. So the local equilibrium is reached extremely fast before you reach global equilibrium. Now, I think that the key of our, um, uh, our analysis, we can prove this is uh, rigorously correct. Roughly speaking, we show that if the time is uh, slightly bigger than one over n, then you really reach local equilibrium. And then, uh, then of course, you go to time one, you reach global equilibrium, which is the easy part. But once your system reaches local equilibrium, then you know the local statistics would be the same as a Gaussian one because you already reach your local equilibrium. So then this means that if you take a Dyson Brownian motion, it means this metric element run by Brownian motion, and you wait for time a little bit, just one of n, it's tiny, tiny time. Then you already find the eigenvalue will arrange itself in such a way it's already in the equilibrium. So this is extremely surprising. This means uh, if you take your, your metric in applications, if you add a bit noise, then your information completely disappear. The local information will completely become uh, this, di this uh, random matrix statistics. So, so this is quite surprising. This means the noise can destroy the information very fast. Okay. So, and this, if you look at mathematics, what it says is, uh, then what it says it means uh, this Wigner Dyson meta conjecture is already correct if you wait for some time. If you take Dyson Brownian motion, you just wait a little bit time, then the theorem is already correct. Okay. So, so now, if the theorem is already correct, but there is still a question because uh, you know we are mathematicians. We are by physics standard, the problem is already solved. And but for mathematicians, <laughs> uh, you still you still care about a tiny bit in the beginning. So what we are saying is uh, the time zero here, 
and then you wait a little bit time here, then this theorem is already correct here. But rigorously in mathematics, you still work, say, well, look, I'm worried about initial data. This is a starting point. You tell me here is correct, that it's completely useless. So, so then you need a way to, to bridge uh, this initial layer. And the theorem says, actually, this th it's actually correct. So this is what we call this continuity of Dyson Brown emotion. We show that in the initial layer, the local statistics didn't change very much. So, and then if we show in the beginning, it didn't change very much. And then we, next, we show it's already correct. Once you wait for a little bit time, then this means it's correct everywhere. So let me show you the picture here. So, uh, so I, I would like to thank N.T. North for making this beautiful picture. Otherwise, I don't know how to explain this. So, so if you, what you're interested in the initial data here, you're starting from here, and then you want to say that the statistics there is the same as time goes to infinity. So we have a theorem that says that if you look at initial layer, then up to a time n to the minus one half, then it's continuity, then the, then the local statistics didn't change very much. And then the second thing is uh, this equilibration of Dyson Brownian motion says that once you go time a little beyond one over n, slightly beyond one over n, then it's the same as the, at the infinity. So you can go from time zero to infinity by two steps. One is using continuity of metric Dyson Brownian motions, and then the second one, you, you use the, this equilibration, this relaxation to equilibrium to show that once you go beyond one of n, it's the same as go to infinity. So if you put these two together, then you prove the, the theorem. So this is quite interesting because, uh, um, you know, in mathematics, there's a general concept uh, quite popular recently. You want to study a problem uh, has, which has no time. But then you run a dynamics, you run a flow. And so that you study, and then study the flow of time goes to infinity to understand the stationary points. And this was, uh, you know, one famous example is Poincare conjecture solved by using this Ricci flow. But on the other hand, what we are doing here is completely different. What we are doing here is uh, we are interested in time equals zero. It's not an infinity. But what we are saying, what we are trying to prove is uh, the time equals zero is correct because I can go a little bit and then I can go a little bit to infinity. So, uh, so it's quite a, um, a remarkable fact that the Dyson Brownian motion preserves these two properties so that it allows us to do the initial layer analysis and also it allows us to do the relaxation to equilibrium. And this, you put these two together, uh, you can solve these problems. Now, what about this uh, quantum unique galvanicity for the matrix case? Now, the quantum unique galvanicity for the matrix, so, uh, so now you take, uh, uh, you take, remember I told you that this uh, eigenvector equation is a nightmare, and I can show you again. Uh, before, you know, for non-mathematician, all the equations are nightmares. So, <laughs> but, but for mathematician, there's still a difference between an easy equation and uh, a complicated equation. So if you look at the Dyson Brownian motion, so this is Dyson Brownian motion, so you can see that everything depends on the eigen, eigenvalues. If you look at eigenvector, this eigenvector is u of k. You see that u of k here, you have u of l here, u of k there, and uh, the b of kl is the Brownian motion, and the denominator is once again the eigen, eigenvalues. And then here you even have eigenvalue to a square, so the whole thing looks like an absolute nightmare. Uh, on the other hand, the observation we made is the following. You see, if you take, uh, take the moments, if you take the moments of eigenvector, and uh, in mathematical terms, you condition on the eigenvalues. So suppose you fix, freeze your environment of eigenvalues. Then you find the equation of the, uh, of the moments of the eigenvector. It becomes uh, this simple equation, this dtftj equal to summation. Now this ftk minus ftj and lambda j minus lambda k squared. So, so roughly, so what he say is uh, it, uh, in mathematics, this equation is a random walk equation. This means uh, uh, if you look at this index j, the index j labeled eigenvector from one to n. 
So what it did is, uh, if you take a second moment, it becomes a random walk. It just jump from here, jump nearby, and jump far away. They just keep on jumping like that. And then the jump rate is given by the, the spacing of the eigenvalues. So, so once you freeze the eigenvalues, so this is just a random walk dynamics. And so you can analyze it. And then the analysis, the, uh, the analysis says uh, this, is the, this is where the DeGeorge and Nash Moser comes in. The DeGeorge and Nash Moser theory says that if you take a parabolic equations or elliptic equations, and if you don't know much about the coefficient, but then, then you still know that the solution will become regular after initial layer. So this was a fundamental discovery. Oh yeah, here. Oh. Yeah. This is fundamental uh, discovery by, uh, by De Giorgi because, uh, oh. I think so. Uh, it was a, it it's, a, it's a foundation of a modern uh, uh, analysis of nonlinear partial differential equation. If you don't have this De Giorgi Nash Moser theory, then, then almost nothing can be done in the uh, truly nonlinear equations. So the observation is uh, if you wait for a little bit time, then your solution becomes regular. And then this means our random walk dynamics has the effect to, re uh, to regularize these uh, uh, second moments. So once the second moment will become quite almost very quickly go to a constant. And that's why it becomes correct. And then um, here, of course, I didn't really explain why uh, this is completely correct because uh, even something is completely flat, it doesn't mean it's a Gaussian or it's a normal random variable. And so there's uh, this edge, edge break part I didn't explain here. But the key ana anal analytic part is, uh, is this uh, DeGeorge Nash Moser uh, theory, which, was, which we did together with uh, Paul Bouguet and uh, uh, Lars Erdish. And then, uh, you, know, you know, sometimes the sci in scientific discovery, uh, scientific work, it's uh, lots of coincidence because uh, we are using heavily this paper by Caffarelli and Chen and Basur. Uh, but this paper of Caffarelli well, just appeared about three years ago, so it seems to be just in time for applications. All right, so now this shows that if you then eigenvector, look at the eigenvector dynamics, and uh, then you wait a little bit time, then the eigenvector will become regular, and then you become Gaussian. So once again, we are in a situation, if you wait a little bit time, your theorem become correct, but you still want to bridge to go to time t equals zero, and this part you can do once again by this continuity of metric Dyson Brownian motion. So it's, this part is a similar idea, it's a similar idea that, like the one I, sh it's a similar idea like this one, except now instead of eigenvector, now I do, uh, instead of eigenvalues, now I do the eigenvector, and this will be correct. So, uh, so this, uh, so the, the key ingredient in this problem is really to, to realize the eigenvector moments has a beautiful flow, and this flow is a random walk in random environments with singular coefficients. Okay, so now, uh, so finally, uh, what, what, uh, how much time I have, I think? Oh, okay. Okay, okay, great. So, so finally, I would like to summarize a bit uh, of uh, uh, what we did here. Is, uh, we, are, we are talking about two questions. One is uh, the universality of random matrices, and the other one is uh, this uh, quantum unit ergodicity. I mean, here we are doing the local version, not really the full, uh, full version. So, so then you find that the Dyson Brownian motion, this dynamic idea, uh, actually can be used to answer both questions in, in the matrix context. And for the universality, what the, the key idea is uh, the Dyson Brownian motion will approach equilibrium very fast locally, and then you plus this uh, continuity of, of Dyson Brownian motion. And in the case of quantum unit galvanicity, uh, you use the Herder regularities, uh, this is uh, mathematical tech, uh, technical terms, to show that this random walk in random environment will approach equilibrium, will, will, give, will have Herder continuity very, very fast, and then you also use this 
continuity of metric Dyson Brownian motion to bridge the initial layer. And you put these two together, then the problem can be answered. And now, I forgot to mention one thing is uh, why the Dyson Brownian motion will approach equilibrium so fast locally. And the reason is because uh, now we are one dimensional, uh, the eigenvalues in one dimensional lot is, is one dimensional problem in one dimension. So any two eigenvalues nearby, the interaction, the Coulomb interaction. So the Coulomb interaction will have a very, very strong force. And this strong force will drive the dynamics to equilibrium very fast. So that's, that's, uh, that's the reason. And the reason is uh, the problem was almost impossible to do 50 years ago when Freeman uh, looked at this problem was because the, at the time there's, there's no, not much tool to understand the relaxation to equilibrium. And now there are many, many ways to do it, especially one can use this logarithmic sovereign inequality and also uh, we use this uh, herd irregularity, also this DeGeorge Nash Moses theory to put it together. I mean, in a way, it's also surprising because the, uh, the DeGeorge Nash Moser theory was also happened around the same time. But it's only after many, many years one realized all these things are come together. Now, uh, the last thing I, w I wish to say is uh, uh, this, this, di uh, this Dyson Brownian motion is idea using a dynamic idea to study the, the problem at time t equals zero. And uh, it's completely different from the typical dynamical idea which you study the asymptotic as time goes to infinity. And this is uh, one of the surprising facts. Um, now, I want to say one more thing about, uh, so this is uh, a, a quote I got uh, from the Freeman Dyson's paper. He says the following, this is by the George Wollenberg. He asked the following question, if you admit that the Wigner ensemble gives a, a completely wrong answer for the label density, why do you believe any of the other uh, prediction of random metric theory? So, so even though today I'm describing to you the solution of Wigner matrices, but actually the, what we did, we, we did a lot of local theory. This means uh, you can localize the problem. Instead of looking at the problem completely, in, in, you know, everywhere as interacting uh, case, you can localize the problem into a small interval so then you can understand the question locally and once you can understand the question locally, then, then you sort of answer the universal uh, uh, universality question. And also you address the question that because the density, once you localize the problem, then the density is not, is not important and density locally will be a constant which will disappear into the picture. So this is one idea. So, and I also should mention that there are, there are many uh, other work in random match I didn't, uh, didn't mention. A, a lot of this was for example, like uh, orthogonal polynomial method, which I, I completely left out because uh, I just want to talk about one single thing, which is Dyson Brownian motion. And there are many people working on orthogonal polynomials uh, and also uh, other exact solvable case. And so, um, so uh, but then I would like to show you the, the last transparency, last slide, which is uh, <laughs> heavy business. <laughs> Thanks a lot.